This guy started his company Rapport Trade in 2003 and he's worked with numerous global companies such as Shell, Daimler Cry Chrysler and Santander Consumer. He's had the opportunity to run his workshops right across the world, so I think it's fair to say this guy knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome from Rapport Training, Mr. Martin Fenton. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody feeling at the moment? Splendid. Splendid. Good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, as of those of us in the audience that uh, have a parents of small children or grandparents of small children, good. Well, I we might be able to relate to this uh, story I want to convey to you because uh, I was. Uh, uh, recently visiting my six-year-old grandson, uh, I wanted to tell him that I had uh, just upgraded my Virgin um, TV service, my cable service, to the, the TiVo box, because I was quite proud that I'd, I'd gone and done that. You probably know the one I mean, the, TV, the TiVo box is the one that uh, pauses, fast-forwards and rewinds live TV, yeah? And that one where you can uh, record six million TV shows at the same time, you probably got something very similar <coughs> at home, I guess. Yeah? Um, now, my six-year-old grandson is quite a, a cool dude. He's got a bit of street cred. And I was talking to him about this. Uh, and to be honest with, it, with you, I wasn't that impressed. Wasn't that impressed at all. I upgraded to the, the TiVo box. And he simply st looked at me, uh, stopped what he was doing, uh, playing with his uh, Doctor Who figurines at the time. I think that's what he was doing. Uh, and quizzically said to me, Granddaddy said, uh, does it have my shows on it? Now, not wanting to appear foolish, but not entirely sure, I said, I think it has. Now, with that, he darted towards the TV cabinet and proceeded to educate me. Now, for those of us that don't know what a TiVo box remote looks like, that's it. Now, it, it's a bit of a, 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 a long, uh, you might not be able to see it from the back, but the My Shows buttons are near the top. So, uh, with remote in hand, um, he began to give me a lesson on how to use this TiVo remote. Here, Granny, he says, here's the My Shows button, are you watching? I said, yes, look, I am. Now, to be honest, he was that quick, and I've no idea what he did next, in all honesty, but within seconds, on the screen, appeared a menu called Luke's Shows. He'd previously made up his own menu, uh, there for everybody to see. And before he flipped back onto the programme that he'd been watching previously, I managed to see on this menu, I think it was about 587 episodes of Peppa Pig and two series of uh, Doctor Who that he'd already pre-recorded. No wonder his mum and dad are fed up with having no room to record their shows on the TV. Now, to be absolutely honest with you, I was blown away by this. He's only six, and I haven't even got to grips with the remote control yet. And there he is, you know, well in advance of me. Now, not only is he whiz on the TiVo box, he also uses Google searches to identify his CBBC online games. <coughs> now, I promise you, both me and my wife and his parents uh, observe his surfing activity very carefully, I promise you that. But he was recently staying at my house and uh, playing one of his online games uh, in the kitchen with my wife on her laptop. I was doing something else in, in the house, and I heard him shout to me, he said, he said I've, I've just reached level 25, Brandon. Now, I have no idea what level 25 meant, but to hear his voice, it was one hell of a massive achievement. I watched him one day playing a game about the gunpowder plot. Now, some of you might remember from, from, from your history lessons, that's where Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament. You might recall that, yeah? And Luke was reading out the instructions. As I was observing him, he was reading out the instructions. And um, I thought, what a great way to learn. What a great way to educate yourself. Because he was having fun while playing and thinking. You see, Luke's a member of Generation Z. He has never not known the existence of the internet or the World Wide Web. He's been brought up by it. He's been educated by it and he will communicate via it throughout the rest of his life. Now, you and I know, in fact, that the World Wide Web is pretty, pretty new. 
uh, that guy, you know, the, the guy that uh, was uh, 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 invented the whole process, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, only did so in 1990. The first website appeared on the World Wide Web on the 6th of August in 1991. So it is a pretty new uh, concept. Now you may wonder why I sort of convey that story to you about my experience uh, with Luke recently. But I was having a conversation not too long ago with a manager from one of the leading motor finance companies. And he was decrying what he termed the lost F&I skills. He was referring to his sort of current staff or new people that were currently joining the industry. And he was a bit concerned about how these lost F&I skills might be preventing him from getting more business out of you know motor dealers uh, and limiting them his new staff from actually understanding how a traditional f and department works in a dealership so it got me thinking about these lost f and skills and i was trying to answer what are they and um, whatever these skills are are they are they relevant to today's marketplace but more importantly, thinking about Luke and thinking about new people joining the automotive and finance industries, you know, what are the future skills that uh, we need to impart to these guys and girls as they join uh, our industry? Sorry, guys, I just lost my place. Yeah. Fine, sorry. Now, uh, I think. Uh, where is it? Andy said I've been in the industry about 30 years, I can't believe it really, but it is around about that sort of time. And I joined the industry in, in 1979. That's the sort of thing we were all driving around in back in the day, uh, a little Renault there. But uh, I guess it was easy in those days, wasn't it, in 1979, early 80s, to sell finance. It was easy for the motor finance companies, it was easy for the dealers. In fact, there was government controls, if you remember, on how much credit consumers could have. If a consumer wanted to borrow some money to buy a car, they had to put a third deposit down and they couldn't repay any longer than two years. Yeah, there was no such thing as bank loans. You borrowed directly from the dealer. It was simple then. You know, we gave the, deal the dealers checkbooks to write their own deals out. It's a good idea, isn't it? I'll try that one again. I don't know what you think about that one. You know, every Friday afternoon as a, a young finance rep, I would finish early. You know, uh, and we'd go down to the pub and meet with the dealers, have a game of pool, a few beers, and I've got to be honest, occasionally drove home. Yeah, we don't seem to have time for that nowadays, do we? The salesmen in the dealership, or do we? <laughs> but the salesmen in the dealerships would often have their sport with the, the finance rep. You know, I remember many occasions where I'd go into the dealership and I'd leave, do the business, uh, and I'd get back to the car, uh, try and start my car, and it wouldn't start. And I'd be attempted to start many, many occasions. And all of a sudden I'd look up and there were all the salesmen in the show <coughs> laughing at me. One of them had a distributed cap in his hand. You know, it's all about having a bit of fun in those days, I guess. Again, you might recall back in the day that dealers asked customers to sign blank finance agreements <laughs> and then fill them in later. Yeah, we accepted customers to finance only if they took PPI. Don't know what happened, what happened to that idea. <laughs> yeah, as a finance rep, we used to debt collect our own arrears. And we'd make home visits when considering customers who had county court judgments. The directors of Lombard, the company I worked for at the time, were chauffeur driven around in Jaguar cars. And we had to call them Mr. Uh, and they even had their own dining room staff when they were entertaining dealers at our regional offices. I'm not sure whether we do that nowadays. A sandwich on the hoof, I think, is about the best we all get. Now, we might remember that things did start to change in the mid-80s when the then Thatcher government came along and, bless her, she removed all those credit controls, didn't she? So that meant the traditional motor finance companies no longer had the monopoly on lending consumers money for cars. Banks and building societies also began to get in on the act. However, it was also around the mid-80s that the finance and automotive industries started to hear of the pioneer of our f &I skills in this country. And that was run by a, a guy called Pat Ryan, and his company, you might recall, was Pat Ryan and Associates. Now, Pat Ryan himself was the uh, American founder of that company in 1964. He was 26 at that, uh, at that time, apparently, to sell auto credit and dealers to dealers and customers. Now, through many acquisitions, we all know that uh, he finally retired from the Aon Corporation in 2008 as a self-made billionaire. Uh, so he's not done that bad out of PPI selling. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, 
Right, now, he, he introduced the concept, didn't he, or Patline Associates introduced the concept of business manager into our showrooms, primarily to sell more of their credit insurance products. <coughs> the idea was quite simple, if you remember, get the deal to concentrate and focus on the sale of finance and insurance separate from the car sale, show him how much mon money he could earn, install a specialist individual into the dealership, i.e. a business manager, and properly train them and wait for the profit to roll in. The concept was quickly adopted by Lombard North Central and its dealers, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, much of the basic training many of us here today uh, will have received will, for the most part, be, be based on the Pat Ryan concepts. And even I remember my business manager training. It was a two-week residential course uh, where we were drilled, practiced, role-played until we lived and breathed the words and phrases to sell and present finance and credit insurance to customers. I'm sure there's many of us in the room that remember those sorts of days. You might remember some of the uh, techniques that we taught. High pencil, you remember that one? You might even use it today. Can you remember three payment closing? I'm sure you use that now on your point of sale systems. The payments are either 250, 200 pound a month, or 150 pound a month, you know, a customer. Uh, which, which do you prefer? The assumption was it would always be the lower one. And of course, we all know how those payments were constructed. They were all the same rate, all had PPI in them. The only difference was the term. Uh, wh why do you think manufacturers only give out a year's warranty on their cars, Mr. Customer? Difficult to use that one these days, I guess, isn't it? How would you feel if someone else could make the payment if you can't? We did objection handling, bank converting, <laughs> cash converting. Yeah, remember those days, some of us? You're all too young, I can see. Okay, yeah. but since the mid-80s, many changes have occurred. We know about that. That's impacted on our businesses. The recession of 1990, the introduction of PCPs, mergers and acquisitions and downsizing in finance companies, the changing role of the business manager, as we now know, from only seeing the customer after the car was sold, uh, to now being integrated into the whole sales process and controlling both the car and add-on sale. Introduction of the finance broker, the development of sub and near prime offerings, the increase in direct lenders, the drop in dealer finance penetration at one time. The introduction of FSA, CCD, SECIS, the PPI scandal, <coughs> voluntary terminations, and the, the crunch in 2008. Someone once said, didn't they? The only constant is change. And to be fair to the automotive and motor finance sectors, we've been pretty good at changing, adapting, and innovating. So what about these traditional F&I skills that we were we brought up with. And more importantly, how are we going to provide these skills and knowledge to somebody like Luke, who might want to enter the motor and finance industry? Some, you know, a member of Generation Z, who, who is moving in this fast and ever-changing world that they're growing up in. See, now we know this, that you know, our new Generation Z uh, will be knowledge-rich, time-poor, and will be overloaded with information at their fingertips, just like Luke. They'll expect information on the move via their smartphones and tablets and in bite-sized chunks. They'll use the web and mobile phones to research, they do this now, they use the web and mobile phones to research the cars they will buy from us and the dealers they'll buy it from. They're doing it now, we know that. In some cases, when they finally visit the dealer, they'll be better informed than the sales team. So it seems logical that if consumers are using a wide range of technology today and will do in the future throughout the buying process, it seems logical that those same technologies should be used to provide learning and more immediate access to product information. Just some stats for you guys, I think you can read that from there. These are just some stats I've got off the internet, would you believe, from Ofcom, which shows the proportion of people who use their mobile handsets to access the internet, the first quarter of this year, we're nearly 40%. So 40% of people have mobile phones are accessing, accessing information via the internet. 92%, we won't be surprised by the other stats, 92% of the adult population in the UK owns a mobile, no surprises there, and the number of mobile sub subscriptions exceeds clearly the number of people in the country at 81.6 million. 
In terms of other mobile activities, you know, we've got 3.62 million tablets currently out there in the country. That's at stats at the end of 2011. I think it's more like getting towards 5 million uh, as we speak. So what I'm suggesting, guys, is our task as dealers and finance companies and brokers is to harness the power of these devices to scale and develop our current and future staff. Now, it's called blended learning. It's not a new concept. Yet, yeah, blended means a mix of classroom, distance learning, which can be webinars nowadays, uh, e-learning, and now even mobile learning. Now, I still believe there's a, a place for face-to-face -face training delivery, as it's very difficult to replace the dynamics of working and learning from others' experience in a group, but we must develop and use these new learning technologies and be aware of how the next generation will be taught. They will live and breathe this stuff. We need to make sure we, we, we catch up. Now, the automotive industry has been early adopters of blended learning. Uh, Toyota has recently um, uh, sponsored um, this particular uh, uh, document, Driving Results with Learning Technologies in the Automotive Sector. Uh, that slide will be on there for a couple of minutes, so you might want to make a note of the, the website and the name of the, the document, because it provides some interesting information in terms of how we as the automotive industry are starting to adopt and adapt this sort of technology. Some automotive companies are already using mobile technology to inform and educate the future customers. For example, Volkswagen. They've uh, recently launched a Volkswagen Touareg Challenge app, uh, which provides basic features like you know, dealer search throughout the country, brochure information about the products. It also sports a pretty neat game in terms of you can choose from a Touareg uh, V6 TDI or a Touareg Hybrid and take it for a spin in, in a, a rally race. You know, Generation Z will be familiar with that sort of format of learning through games. Mercedes are uh, having a good go at this, clearly. They're trying to reach new, re teach new things, sorry, by asking customers to take a quiz about the history of mobility, destinations you can drive to, about sport, <coughs> about innovations, about some of the technology they're introducing, some of the design or environmental issues that, that they are currently considering. All this methodology is designed to reach out to the current and future car buying public using the latest technologies. However, finance companies and brokers need also to consider how they continue to support, skill and inform dealers about their offering. Whether it's the latest finance campaigns direct to a car salesman's mobile, just-in-time showroom reminders, maybe of things of what to say, uh, or how to introduce PCP, or finance objection handling techniques maybe. I don't know, words and phrases that show gap, pain protection, or how a, near, how a near prime offering may help sell more cars. You know, I guess the, the ideas are endless in terms of what information we can impart on these devices now and in the future. You might recall in 1999, Bill Gates wrote in his book, Business at the Speed of Thought, here on the edge of the 21st century, a fundamental new rule of business is that the internet changes everything. We now know that we're living that. So our task is to understand what are the skills that we currently will and Generation Z will require in the future if they should choose to enter our markets, automotive or finance markets, and how can we use that technology to help them sell cars and finance in the show. And more importantly, how do we embrace the new and latest technologies to enable us to deliver rich and entertaining learning solutions? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Martin. I've come over this side of the room to uh, find a, a willing victim or two. So I think some very, very interesting stuff there. So I think what you're saying is the world's not flat anymore, is that right? It's not, my friend, is it? <laughs> Hello, yes, Martin. It's uh, Ian Beadle from Cogitive Motor Group. Hello, um, yeah, interestingly, e-learning. How do you see that in the proportion to actual face-to-face -face training still? It depends what it depends what you're teaching. It depends what you're teaching. Um, particularly in our industry, in automobile, things like compliance and regulation is already taken up as a method of uh, teaching that sort of thing around e-learning. Um, but I think we're seeing more and more of it in terms of sales process as well. 
Uh, and if you read the report, I, you know, I heard you to read the report that uh, Toyota has sponsored, you'll see some really good statistics in terms of the, the split of the type of training that's done, certainly within the automotive industry, and what's taken on. Um, I mean, we're all familiar with e-learning. You, you and I used to call it CBT, computer-based training, and pretty, in, in, in the past time, it was pretty archaic stuff and quite boring. But given, given what we've seen today, for instance, from Peter's uh, presentation, we can include video now, can't we? We can include uh, voice in e-learning, you know, in terms of interactivity of um, the, the, the methods we can use, the more attractive to the learner. So I think e-learning has moved up a gear. In, in, in many respects. And also the manufacturers are doing some very good work on that. You'll see for yourself, I'm sure. Nick. Uh, yeah, hi Martin. Um, uh, it's Nick uh, Brushett from Pinnacle Finance. Yes, Where do you see um, the e-learning that you're talking about fitting in the broker fraternity? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think the broker fraternity um, has um, often a lot of product range uh, to offer to the deal. If you think about the, the prime, the near prime, the sub prime offerings, it gives back some of the terms and conditions of the products that you sell. Uh, this, if, and for a, for a car salesman, that can be quite daunting in terms of it's getting perhaps getting that information across to the, to the car salespeople in terms of what that, how that helps them sell more cars. And I think perhaps we can be a bit more innovative around that, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, talking a lot uh, so far about e-learning, transferring information between <coughs> funders and dealers, between yeah. brokers and dealers, etc. Um, you know, one thing I identified earlier, and a big headache for us, is public misunderstanding of financial products. Yes. Uh, especially from a compliance point of view, that's quite significant. Looking at the internet, looking at social media, what do you think the finance industry and the retail industry uh, can do to use technology as a strategy to, to get the public knowing what to expect once they're in the showroom? That's, a, that's a, a, a very good question. It's a big question, that, isn't it, in many ways as well. But I guess if you think about what the FLA have done with the SAF programme, uh, they, they uh, 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 I forget the, the last figures, but thousands and thousands of dealer people have gone through that. So I mean, in terms of what the, our governing body, our trade body is doing, there's certainly a, a lot of work that they're prepared to do. Um, and, but I think, I don't know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, all those sorts of things, I guess, are part and partial of an overall learning environment. I think we just don't know enough about it yet, and how we can adapt what was our traditional skills, which are still relevant, how do we come, what about, you know, Luke, who just is an absolute whiz on this stuff. He gets it. You know, he's living and breathing it. So we've got to think about, I'm not got the answer of how we do it today, but we need to collectively think about how do we use these new medias to people, you know, young, young people that are buying cars from us. You know, in the 20s, for Online example. Online acronym uh, Who knows? Who knows? Good, good example. Don't score that dancing on you, by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I said earlier, you know, everybody that's coming up here today gives the time for free, really thinks long and hard about the content. Martin, that was very fun. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.